may be thinking that there isn't anything in Candyman that could happen in real life. Well, I have a story for you that suggests otherwise, and it's the very tragic murder of Ruthie Mae McCoy. The movie Candyman is based on Clive Barker's short story called The Forbidden, and it's a part of his Books of Blood anthology. Grad student Helen Lyle and her best friend Bernadette are working on their thesis on urban legends and folklore. And this is how she learns about the Candyman legend. Candyman was the ghost of a man named Daniel Robitaille. He was a very talented artist and the son of a wealthy former slave. And he was murdered in the late 19th century because of his relationship with Caroline. Now, Caroline was the daughter of a wealthy white man that had commissioned Daniel to paint her portrait. But they fall in love and she gets pregnant and her father is furious. So he hires some men to kill Daniel and this is how he becomes Candyman. Candyman's ashes were spread on the area that would one day become Caprini Green. Now let's talk a little bit about the medicine cabinets because they're one of the biggest parts of this story. Now in the movie, you see a newspaper article that says cause of death, what killed Ruthie Jean and life in the projects. The newspaper article also mentioned that she was the 23rd unsolved murder that year in Cabrini Green. Cabrini Green was a public housing project in Chicago and the show Good Times was set there and it was infamous for how dangerous it was. And during the first three months of 1981, 11 people had been murdered and 37 had been shot. In Chicago Housing Authority Towers, CHA, babies had been tossed out of windows and teenagers were shoved down elevator chutes. Criminals would sometimes just bust right through apartment walls to rape and murder tenants. On Candyman, there's a character named Ruthie Jean, and she was taking a bath when she heard a noise that sounded like someone was trying to bust through her wall. So she called 911 and she told them what she heard, but they didn't believe her because they thought that she was crazy and they didn't understand what she was saying. She calls 911 again and they still don't believe her. In the movie, Ruthie Jean has a neighbor. Her name is Anne Marie McCoy. So Anne Marie heard Ruthie screams and she called 911, but unfortunately, when they finally did arrive, Ruthie was dead. So in the movie, the residents believed that she was killed with a hook by Candyman, but she was actually killed by the leader of a gang that came in through her medicine cabinet. He was simply using Candyman's name. Ruthie Jean's death was based on the real life death of Ruthie Mae McCoy. Ruthie lived in a housing project called Grace Abbott Homes, and this wasn't far from Cabrini Green. And a great deal of the movie was shot at Cabrini Green. But just like the real Ruthie Mae McCoy, Ruthie Jean called the police, yet she still died alone. And they were both victims of the bathroom break-ins of the 1980s. This is Ruthie Mae McCoy's story. Around 8.45 at night on April the 22nd in 1987, 52-year-old Ruthie Mae McCoy called 911. She told them that someone in the apartment next door was trying to come through her bathroom mirror. She said, they throwed the cabinet down and they want to come through the bathroom. But the dispatcher immediately assumed that Ruthie was crazy because what she said didn't make sense. Ruthie was mentally ill. She was paranoid schizophrenic, but she was also correct. She lived on the 11th floor. So she made sure to tell the dispatcher that the elevators were working. The elevators, the lights, and the utilities were out of order so much that when they did work, it was a big deal and it was worth mentioning. The toilets were often backed up and the ceilings and the walls were crumbling. It wasn't rare for people to break into apartments through the medicine cabinets. Maintenance workers used the narrow passages for easy access to the plumbing. All you had to do was remove six screws from one of the medicine cabinets, pull the cabinet out of the wall, crawl through the pipe chase, and then kick in the other cabinet. It had gotten so bad that people would put furniture in front of the bathroom doors, or they would keep a bucket nearby at night so they wouldn't have to go to the bathroom. And people that lived at the end of a hallway that had a vacant apartment next door were particularly susceptible and nearly 30% of the 148 units in Ruth's building were vacant in 1987. 
Ruthie May lived next door to a vacant apartment when she died, and drug dealers were using that apartment to sell and to do drugs. In her 20s, Ruthie started talking to herself from time to time, and she would snap at strangers. And she had her daughter, Vernetta, when she was 27, and she never married. In 1983, she had a basement apartment in another apartment building that flooded. So she applied to the Chicago Housing Authority for emergency housing. And she asked specifically not to be placed in a high rise project because those places scared her. But the waiting lists were so long for their row houses and the walk ups that for years, the only immediate openings that they had were in the high rises. So Ruthie May was offered an apartment in the Grace Abbott homes on the 11th floor in a 15 story building. So with nowhere else to go, she moved into apartment 1109 in May of 1983. Before she died, Ruthie's neighbors said that she was more pleasant than she had ever been. She was getting help from a psychiatric clinic and she was also taking her GD classes there. She had been approved for SSI and that's federal aid for people that are physically or mentally disabled. So that made her monthly income double. She went from the $154 that she had been receiving from general assistance to $140. And SSI is paid retroactively to the date of the application. So the first check that she was sent was for $1,979, which would be around $4,600 today. And most people in her neighborhood made around $4,600 per year. Ruthie was planning to move out of the projects and get away from the young people that harassed her and threatened her. And in her building, she was known as Miss May, the crazy funny lady that carried a stick. She would wave that stick at the young people that had their radios too loud in the hallway or that were making fun of her. Because the operator probably assumed that Ruthie was mentally ill, she wasn't taken seriously. So the call was noted as a disturbance with a neighbor. A few minutes later, two more calls came through to 911 about screams and four gunshots that were coming from Ruthie's apartment. Police were dispatched and they arrived 10 minutes later. The officers knocked on her door, but there was no answer. So they asked the janitor for a key to the apartment, but unfortunately the key didn't work for some reason. The police officers wanted to break down the door, but they were advised not to by the security guards because if she was alive, they could possibly be sued. So since they weren't able to get into her apartment, they left about 40 minutes later. So the next day, her neighbor called police and asked them to check on Ruthie. She also called the project office and asked for a manager to open Ruthie's door. And that neighbor did so even though her children advised her not to. The laws in Grace Abbott homes were enforced by the drug dealers. So you weren't supposed to talk to the police about anything. Someone from the Chicago Housing Authority came to Ruthie's door with the carpenter who drilled the lock on the door. And once they got inside, they found Ruthie lying on her bedroom floor. And she had been shot four times in the shoulder, the thigh, her abdomen, and her right arm. And a doctor said that even if she had have made it to the hospital, she probably still would not have survived. Two men, Edward Turner, 18, and John Hondras, age 21, were both arrested and they were charged with murder, home invasion, armed robbery, armed violence, and residential burglary. One was arrested the day after Ruthie's body was found and the other two weeks later. Witnesses claimed that they saw the two men carrying Ruthie's 19 inch color TV and her rocking chair around the project in the early mornings after her death. In court, a handful of friends and relatives came in support of the defendants, but only one person was there on behalf of Ruthie, her brother Willie. And due to a lack of evidence, the charges against the two men were dropped after two years of the trial. The victim's daughter, Vernetta McCoy, she sued the Chicago Housing Authority for the cause of her mother's death. A 19 inch RCA television and a caned back rocking chair sat on the carpet near the prosecution table. And those items were later found in the home of another of the defendant's friends. 
and Willie said that he had last seen his sister about three months before she was killed. He said that Ruthie would give you the shoe strengths off of her shoes if she knew that it would help you. She also used to help him with his homework. He said that he used to copy off of her paper. He said, I was older, but she was smarter. Candyman the legend was getting credit for crimes that were committed by the living, which in turn made people fear him even more. And it's where his actual power came from. Candyman said that Helen's disbelief in him destroyed the faith of his followers and that he can't exist if they don't believe that he's real. And that was the reason that he appeared to her and he says that he must kill her in order to keep his legend in the minds of his believers. We learn this when he says that I am the writing on the wall, the whisper in the classroom. Without these things, I am nothing. The mirror that contains his soul is the secret of his power. If the mirror is destroyed, he ceases to exist. And we see this in the second movie, Farewell to the Flesh. The cast and crew had to make deals with some of the local gang leaders who controlled Cabrini Green and agreed to put multiple residents in the film as extras in order to assure safe working conditions. And Tony Todd was told to watch out for snipers during production and a production vehicle was actually hit by a sniper's bullet near the end of the shoot, but no one was hurt. Tony Todd was reportedly paid $1,000 for every sting that he received from the live bees that were used in the movie. He was stung 23 times. In the years since Candyman came out, more than 250,000 units of public housing have been demolished across the U.S. The last Cabrini Green Tower came down in 2011 and a Candyman reboot is scheduled to release on August the 27th of this year, 2021, and Jordan Peele is a producer.